palatable so that you allow them to be able to be swallowed. They are smaller in size and they can be swallowed. Number two, we said there is this thing called deglutination or swallowing. Deglutination or swallowing occurs in three phases, the oral phase, the pharyngeal phase, the voluntary the esophageal phase and the pharyngeal phase, they are involuntary. And I hope you remember the voluntary phase or the oral phase, the tongue mixing food with saliva and then pushing it backwards towards the throat. And then the pharyngeal phase is where the soft palate closes to prevent food to go into the nose. The epiglottis closes to prevent food going into the airway. And then the lower esophagus muscle relaxes. And then food will pass into the esophagus, and then the esophageal phase basically is the peristalsis. And then we mentioned that peristalsis in the esophagus has two phases. There is a primary phase and a secondary phase. Primary peristalsis and secondary peristalsis. And then when food passes through the esophagus, it reaches what is known as the lower esophageal sphincter. We say the lower esophageal sphincter is a physiological sphincter. It's formed by the cura of the diaphragm. It's formed by thickening of muscles around the esophagus. And then we mentioned that this sphincter is important for preventing refluxing from the stomach. And if there is refluxing from the stomach, we call that gastro, gastro, and the gastroenteric reflux disease, G E A G E R G. If there is refluxing, meaning things from the stomach will spill up going back into the esophagus, we call that G. And we feel that we feel. How to say, you are able to notice there is dirt because you are going to have a heartburn. Heartburn is simply gastroesophageal reflux. Okay. Then we talked about achalasia. We say that if the esophagus, if the lower esophageal sphincter is not opening up, we call that achalasia. And in 90% of people, achalasia is congenital. People are born with it. They're just born like that. Once in a while, we find people who also have wounds. Later on, maybe I hope did an accident, had an operation, and then the nervous system around it, the lower esophageal area, stops working. That can also cause aparesia. Can also cause the reflux disease. All right. And then we started talking about the stomach. And then may I ask a question? Like, can I just assume that we learned about the stomach? No. Ah. Mm. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Okay. So the stomach, let's start from there. Then we will pick it up as we go. The stomach. So we said the stomach is a cassata. <laughs> seated on the left side of the body <coughs> under the diaphragm. We mentioned that the stomach has the four regions. It's important to note or to comment that the stomach has on one side it curves towards the diaphragm, on the other side it curves again towards other organs. In other words, we are saying the stomach has these two curvatures. It has two curves. One curve on top and another curve under it. So the curve on top is known as the lesser curvature. The curve under it is known as the greater curvature. Don't worry, you will learn about this in another topic to make sense. <coughs> then, the other thing we said is that the stomach on the upper part where the esophagus joins the stomach, we call that area the cardiac area. And then it has a bulging or a tent on top, which is what we call the pandas of the stomach. And then it has an elongation coming downwards, we call the body of the stomach. And then at the end of the stomach where it joins the intestines, we call it the antrum of the stomach. 
as the stomach is being joined by the intestines, the small intestines, it has a stiff muscle. It has a thick muscle around it. And that muscle is known as the, the pyloric sphincter. Okay? So you have a pyloric sphincter at the end of the muscle, at the end of the stomach where it joins the intestine. Significance of a sphincter to prevent it acid from the stomach going into the intestines. That's the significance of a pyloric sphincter. Okay, now, later on, when you are doing this thing called digestive, um, what, what have you discussed about DR? Have you discussed DR? Yeah. So the people in anatomy have not come to tell you, no, we're going to hmm? give each one of you a dead body. They mm -hmm. haven't discussed those issues. The books are about to... And no one has, and during orientation, you had orientation, right? Don't just go. They didn't orient you. They didn't take you to the mortuary at UTH. They didn't tell you something like when you come here, the mortuary will allow you to get a dead body and pack it up in pieces. I'm very sorry. I think by the time you guys are done, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, it does not happen. But I'm very scared for you guys. By the time you guys are graduating, you'll be the people that we call half death doctors. <coughs> I pray it doesn't happen to you. I hope it doesn't. They used to tell us the same thing. Even us when we started, we said, oh, you guys are many. You become half death doctors. Look at us now, smiling. <laughs> so, anyways, the point is, don't worry. Even if I have bed doctor, it's okay. <laughs> the half bed doesn't matter. You think when you go out there to your mother, she will say, "Oh, half bed doctor." She won't say that. You are a doctor. You're a doctor. You think your salary will be like, "Oh, half bed doctor, half salary." No, <laughs> salary is up to your better. Whether you have debt, we know this because we have people. Have you, do you guys know anyone who has gone to China? Since you guys are in second year, I'm sure when you're in high school, you had this friend who got lucky and got jealous that went to China <laughs> five years from now. They come back. Believe me, you. Even what you call one plus one equals two. <laughs> It will look strange to them. Very strange. Very, very strange. I don't know what happened with China. I, I, I don't understand. We had uh, a doctor coming in from China. Started working at UTH. This doctor, they gave him a patient. And this patient, he gets an x-ray of this patient. And after getting an X-ray of the patient, he said, "Tell this patient, you are very sick. You are going to die. <laughs> you are very, very sick." So the patient asked, "What's the problem? Mm, this patient has a very big heart. This heart is big. My one party by X-ray. So what we're going to do is go to UTH and look for heart doctors." For some reason, these people, they know my name. They just go like, ah, okay, let's call someone who we know. They called me and said, we're bringing a patient to your TH. He has a big heart. The doctor said he's going to die. Then I asked, what is the problem with this patient? No, it's a two-year-old child who is coughing. Ah, a two-year-old child who is coughing. He's that you look at the way it's cold. Children will cough, isn't it? It's a true season. I don't want to cough. No, they did an x-ray, they said the heart is big. Oh, okay. To bring the child. The child came. We looked at the x-ray and the doctor forgot to ask one simple question. The one simple question is he asked was the x-ray taken from the front or from the back? <laughs> <laughs> so 
human being, it will be disconnected from the Christ. Let us just be. It will be big, isn't it? Now, this is a child who you can't tell the child in a million pattern of pocket. It's not possible. So, what are you going to do? You hold the child like this, you take the x ray. You understand what I'm saying? Huh? This is a child who they got an x ray from the front and the heart. Anyways, my point is, you go to China, it's okay to go to China, it's okay to learn medicine, it's fine, it's faster, it's shorter, it's easier, believe me, it's easier. However, exposure is not there. So you come back as dull as you went. <laughs> The only difference is you are an advanced grade. Yeah. But anyway, don't tell them I say that. <laughs> In my experience, that's what I'm seeing. All right. Anyways, let's come back. The stomach. So we're talking about the stomach. We say the stomach is a cancer car. It can carry about five liters of food and then. It has a greater curvature, lesser curvature, it has the cardiac region, fundus region, body, and the antrum. Okay? Then the other thing we mentioned last time about the stomach is that it has three layers of muscles compared to other, man, other parts of the GIT. The three layers you have the oblique muscles, you have the longitudinal muscles, you have the secular muscles. Okay? So now, for the sake of our function, we say the functions of the GIT is motility, secretion, digestion. Anyone with a laptop? Anyone with a laptop with an HDMI port? Or we can just be talking like this, it's okay? It's fine? No one has a laptop. You have it. No, oh, I think there is someone else. about the rugae and everything else. However, for us, our focus is number one, motility. What type of motility of movement occur in the stomach? So there are three important movements in the stomach. Number one, we call it the adaptive relaxation, adaptive relaxation or receptive relaxation. What it means is that when food reaches the stomach, the stomach will relax to allow that food to be inside it. The more you eat, the more the stomach will continue relaxing, it will continue relaxing to allow or to accommodate that food. And because there are three layers of smooth muscle, the stomach is able to relax to a point that it will reach the pelvis. You know the pelvis side? In other words, the stomach can be from here all the way down here. It can relax that much and it will fill up the food all the way there. And then, so it, it has that capacity. It's called the receptive relaxation or adaptive relaxation. Number two, another type of movement that occurs in the stomach is mixing movements. So we have this mixing movement where there will be peristalsis against a closed pylorus. 
peristosis against a closed pyloras. That's mixing movement. In other words, the stomach will keep squeezing, 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 and that food won't go anywhere. It will still be in the stomach. It will squeeze again from up all the way down, and it will still be in the stomach. Because the pyloras is closed, that food is not escaping. In other words, at the end of the day, it just gets it crushed. So in, by doing this mixing movement, the stomach is able to achieve two things. Number one, it's able to break down the food mechanically. And number two, it's able to mix the food with the gastric juices. So the food gets mixed with juices and it breaks down into smaller pieces. And at the end of the day, you have this porridge or soup-like looking substance, which you call the chyme or chyme, whichever pronunciation you're going to use. So you have this thing or this fluid or this porridge in the stomach called the chyme. <coughs> and this porridge, because it's porridge enough, even if the pyrolus is closed, it can still pass through, it can still squeeze itself through the pyrolus. So you have another type of movement in the stomach which is called the propulsive movement. This is basically just peristalsis that pushes the food through the open pyloras. So it will push the kind, the fluid or the highly dissolved semi-fluid, semi-solid substance to pass through the pyloric sphincter. When it gets there, So he's all right, I'll get to that. So what we're saying is that there will be peristosis and the peristosis will squeeze the time through the pyronic sphincter. Now, this is what the, the this is what happens when something goes from the stomach into the intestine, there is something called the gastroenteric reflex. So you have a reflex which is called gastroenteric reflex. The reflex is in two parts. Number one, it is a hormonal reflex. Number two, it is a neuro reflex. So number one, let's talk about the, whole, the neuro reflex. When food from the stomach goes into the intestine, the intestine, the, the layer, the epithelium of the intestine will sense that. And once it senses, the receptors will check, is this food acidic or non-acidic? If this food is acidic, it will send a nervous impulse back to the pyroras to tell it, please squeeze harder. And the pyroras will squeeze harder and it will prevent any more fluid from going out of the stomach into the intestine. You understand, ka? So there is that neural reflex, which tells the pyroras to squeeze a bit more whenever the food that goes into the intestine is dangerous for the intestine. If the food is okay, the intestine will be like, I think this is all right. What will they, they it will send another neural impulse to the muscles of the pyloras and the muscles of the pyloras will relax and that will allow more time to move from the stomach into the intestine. We understand, yeah? Hope that answers the question. All right, so at the end of the day, you have this thing called a gastroenteric reflex. Number two, this gastroenteric reflex also sends neural impulses to other parts of the intestine. This neuron to other parts of the intestine increases movement. It increases motility. So what will happen is, I, I don't know if you've seen this before, especially if you eat shima. If you eat shima now, 10, 20 minutes from now, you feel like going to poop. Have you noticed that? You don't, you haven't noticed that. You see this a lot in babies also. If you 
breastfeed the baby. After 10, 15 minutes, the baby wants to go and poop. That is normal. It is known as a gastrocolic reflex or gastroenteric reflex. What we are saying is that if there is some food being received in the stomach, the stomach will send a nervous impulse to tell the intestine that can you please remove what you have already because there is some more coming. And then you feel the urge to go and do likewise. And that's that. Huh? So this is called the eh, gastroenteric reflex. There is also something called the gastroileal reflex. The ileum is the ileum, how to say, the ileum and the cecum. You know the ileum and cecum, right? Eh? When I say that, you understand what that means. Huh? So there is the cecal area. They say that it's one of the smallest regions in the small intestine. So what happens is that when food enters the stomach, there's a nerve impulse sent to that part of the body to say, can you please try and relax because we are sending food to that side. And there will be that relaxation. Okay? So basically you have three reflexes that occur when food is moving from the stomach towards the intestine. Number one, gastroenteric, gastrocolic, gastroileal reflexes. Okay? Thereafter, we understand. <laughs> And then another type of movement is called the migrating motor complex. Migrating motor complex is the type of peristalsis that occurs when you have not eaten anything. The, what you say, Ashan, hunger noises, hunger pain, mm -hmm. that's the migrating motor complex. <coughs> so migrating motor complex is in three phases. First, it will start slow, you won't even notice. That's a type one. Later on, it will be apatari patari, that's a type two. And then later on, it will become frequent and it will become audible. And then, for example, you will have a No. So, those are what? Type three motor, migrating motor complexes. Migrating motor complexes do not just happen in the stomach, they also happen in the intestine. So you have this peristalsis that occurs when you have fasted or when you haven't eaten anything after a period of oh, six hours. <coughs> and the purpose of that is to try and push and push if there is any more remaining food through the, to the, uh, it's trying to push food to the intestine so that if there's anything remaining, there will be absorption and the absorption will give you some more energy. However, theory has it that a human being can live for five days on one single slice of bread. So ideally, the whole week, we are just supposed to eat two slices of bread. Then we will leave. <laughs> ideally. All right. All right. So we've talked about the movements of motility in the, in the stomach. Number two, secretions in the stomach. The secretion in the stomach are called the gastric juices. And we mentioned last time that gastric juices are made by gastric glands, which are also known as gastric pits. And we mentioned that gastric pits contain different types of cells depending on the region of the stomach they are found. 
we say that there are cells which are called goblet cells, and the goblet cells produce the mucus. Mucus is important for the lining of the stomach, it prevents the acid from burning the stomach. We talked about parietal cells, these are the cells that will produce hydrochloric acid. And then we also talked about the chief cells. These are the cells that will produce pepsinogen and intrinsic factor. Then we also mentioned that there are entrocomaffin cells which produce serotonin and there are entrocomaffin like cells which produce the, um, histamine. And then you also have other cells at the antrum or other glands at the antrum which are known as the G cells which produce a hormone called gastrin. And this hormone called gastrin is responsible for increasing hydrochloric acid secretion when there is food inside the stomach. And then we have one. Yeah. The chief cells for pepsinogen, the parietal cells for hydrochloric acid, the enterocomaffin cells for histamine and serotonin, and then you also have G cells for gastrinic hormone. And we know that gastric hormone is a hormone that is produced within the stomach and it only acts within the area around the stomach. One, it increases the movement in the intestines, and number two, it's it increases secretion of acid from the chief cells and, um, and the parietal cells. We also talked about how hydrochloric acid is produced by the parietal cells. We talked about uh, the, how carbonic acid is produced by carbonic anhydrase. We talked about the dissociation. We talked about the antiporter transport of bicarbonate with uh, chloride. And then we also talked about the active transport of hydro hydrogen ions from the parietal cell into the canaliculi by the sodium, pot the potassium hydrogen ATP. And then we also mentioned something about it, the significance of the canaliculi. It allows it for concentration, and that concentration allows for diffusion of chloride and diffusion of water out from the cell into the canaliculi and into the stomach lumen. Okay? Now, the other thing that we have to remember about the stomach is the digestion. What kind of digestion occurs in the stomach? We mentioned one, there is mechanical digestion, which is brought about by the movement. We talked about mixing movements, which cause the breakdown into time. Number two, there is chemical digestion in the stomach, which allows trypsin. We talked about it. Trypsin as trypsin is sorry. Pepsin. Pepsinogen in the, is produced by your chief cells, and then this pepsinogen is exposed to the hydrochloric acid and becomes activated, and then it forms the pepsin. There are other other enzymes that are also produced. However, pepsinogen is the most abundant. And this pepsin will break down the proteins to begin the digestion of proteins. When it begins the digestion of proteins, what we see is that there will be a breakdown into different types of um, peptides. You can have bipeptides, you can have tripeptides, you can have oligopeptides. In other words, pepsin specific uh, product. It breaks down the, the proteins into many different types of products. So when we ask pepsin produces amino acids, we don't know. It's true, it's maybe false, because it produces different types of products. You understand? Huh? So if we ask you, does pepsin produce oligopeptides? Yes, it does. Does pepsin produce dipeptides? Yes, it does. Does it make amino acids? Yes, it does. You understand, huh? Yeah. All right. 
Moving on, absorption. The absorption that occurs in the, in the stomach is mostly small lipid soluble substances such as water can be absorbed in the stomach, alcohol can be absorbed in the stomach. Okay? Then the other thing about alcohol that we want you to remember though is that this alcohol when you drink it, it dissolves very quickly and it encourages the secretion of acid. When alcohol is detected in the stomach, it encourages the secretion of gastric acid. When the acid increases, you get to have what is known as jade. We've already talked about what jade is. So in short, we're trying to tell you that for those of us that drink, we are highly likely to develop what are known as peptic ulcers. Why? Because once we drink, whatever we drink is going to increase gastric secretion and that gastric secretion is going to erode, is going to burn the intestine, the stomach, the walls of the stomach. And when the wall of that stomach is burned, the fear we have is that you develop an ulcer at the end of the day. And that ulcer is what we call a peptic ulcer. So, we are simply saying drinking alcohol is a risk factor for one, gastritis. Remember we talked about gastritis, inflammation of the stomach as a result of increased acid secretion. And number two, you are going to have peptic ulcer disease. All right, so the other thing I want you to know about, so moving on, about from the stomach. After the food is produced, after food is moved or pushed out from the stomach, goes into the intestine, remember we mentioned there is number one, reflex response, which is, we say it can be neuro, can be hormonal. Now, on the hormonal part, there's something we didn't mention, that there is a hormone which is produced called cholecystokine, and this hormone called cholecystokine goes to the gallbladder and tells the gallbladder, food is coming, and the gallbladder releases the bile. Also, the cholecystokine goes to the pancreas and tells the pancreas, food is coming, and the pancreas releases the pancreatic juices. So, in other words, there are hormones produced once food is released from the stomach into the intestine. There will be hormones that are produced which tell the pancreas and the liver to prepare for that food. And that those juices will enter through the common bowel duct and, and all that biliary trees that we're going to talk about later on. Okay? The other things that control whether food should come out or should stay in the stomach. Number one, you, we mentioned this last time to say if there's smooth muscle in the intestines and when smooth muscle is stretched, it contracts, which tells us that there is a certain volume that the stomach can tolerate. If you put a high, num high, high volume of food in the stomach, it means you are encouraging contraction of the stomach, which tells us that a higher volume will cause this early release of food from the stomach. I hope you understand what I'm going to say. There's this thing I'm calling gastric empty of food moving from the stomach into the intestine. And that thing called gastric empty, like we said, number one, it depends on the volume of food that you put in the stomach. Number two, it will depend on the type of food that you put in the stomach. The fluid or liquid food passes easily compared to other types of food. Number, so if you put solids, solids will take a long time to move from the stomach into the <coughs> intestine because it has to be digested, it has to be made into time. If you drink water, there is a groove in front of the stomach 
which just allows water to trickle all the way. So water does not usually sit in the stomach. It just passes by. So in other words, I say in gastric emptying depends on the state of the fluid. If it's the liquid state or solid state. Then the other thing about gastric emptying is it depends on the type of food you eat. Proteins take a long time to be digested, therefore they stay longer in the stomach compared to fatty foods. Fatty foods also will stay a bit longer, but compared to carbohydrates, carbohydrates tend to move a bit faster. So depending on the type of food that you've taken. There are also other things like medicines and drugs that will reduce the movements in the stomach. And blah, 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 blah. Generally, you go read about the diet the factors that affect the movement of substance from the stomach into the intestine. Remember we mentioned one, there are hormones, which we say it can be produced by the intestines. Two, we talked about the volume of food, we talked about type of food, and then also um, earlier on we mentioned about the acidity of food. We said if the earth food is very acidic, the pyro it tells, the body tells the pyroras to constrict and prevent movement. So even acidity of food will tell us whether we are going to increase gastric emptying or reduce gastric emptying. We understand that. Yeah? And then we have one abnormal type of movement in the stomach. <coughs> Honestly, I've never heard of <laughs> I've never heard of that affecting it. I know about wine. There is a theory that if you are eating and drinking wine at the same time, remember what we say, the alcohol reaches the stomach, it does what it is, encourages secretion of gastric juices. So as you drink wine and eat at the same time, it means you are encouraging digestion in the stomach. So they will be a faster. That's why people will encourage you that when you go for a fry, when you are frying, you should also be doing what? Eh? The hunters for this deal. Because they know that as you take for this deal and you take the, that beef, remember we say proteins take a long time in the stomach. However, when you throw in something to encourage gastric digestion, it means that you are encouraging that thing to be digested quickly and to leave the stomach quickly. I don't know about water. I've never read anything about water. Okay, maybe you can hold the questions. You write it down somewhere, remind me when you are done. All right, so we are saying the other, there is one type of abnormal movement which you're supposed to talk about, is which occurs in the stomach. And this movement is known as the vomiting. So, this movement called vomiting, you are supposed to know which nerves are involved in vomiting and how they bring about vomiting. In simple terms, there is this thing called the Evasauva Maneuver. Evasauva Maneuver. Vasalva maneuver simply means your abdominal muscles will contract with enough force against a closed glottis. So your glottis will close and your abdomen will contract and all other parts of the body will relax. That is called a Vasalva maneuver. We do a Vasalva maneuver when you have gone to the toilet, you have sat on that pan, it is six minutes, Nothing has happened. What do you do? <laughs> That's it. Masao Mamani. Understand? Like I said, the simply put, it is the glottis is closed, the other parts of the body relax, and the abdominal muscles contract. That is Masao Mamani. When um, I was in the fourth year, when I was in fifth year, we went to write a test, and we had this paper, so it was starting, starting, starting. 
After studying, they were like, oh, it's five minutes to the exam. Let me go and bath so that I go write the exam. She went to bath. We all dressed up. We went to the exam. One hour into the exam, the roommate stood up and said, my friend is not here. So one of the invigilators went back to the room, looked for this person, was nowhere to be found. Tried calling, phone was not ringing, was not being picked up. That's how they asked, where was the last place you saw this person? We saw them going to bath. They went in the bathroom, found the person face down. The person died. Why did they die? What happened? You sit. Out shower. You do like this. Your whole body does it. <laughs> that is because there is something called a vagus nerve, which we we'll mention as we we'll say you have to know the nerve cause this type of movement. There's something called the vagus nerve. When you stimulate this, have you read about the, the is it in Chipata, in Lola? The woman who kicked the husband in the night and he died. You haven't read, it's in Lola. You've read about the guy. This is what, last week or two weeks ago? Same thing. When you stimulate the Vegas name, the Vegas name is everywhere, in all parts of the world. So this man, whatever you're trying to do it to the wife, is, the wife just decided, you know what, where the son doesn't die. And, and that's how the man died. And like you said, there is this thing called the Vegas nerve, which when you stimulate it, it just causes your heart to just boom. Your heart switches off. If you are not lucky, that's the end. If you buy it. And then we'll show you, we'll put your video on a thousand ways to die. In, on a thousand ways to die, you haven't seen people at it, you went to. <laughs> so anyways, long story short, there's a nerve which is called the Vegas nerve. When you have these other things called, that cause vomiting. These other things that cause vomiting are going to, be, to stimulate your Vegas nerve. Your Vegas nerve is going to stimulate a part in your brain which is known as the vomiting center. And this vomiting center is going to send impulses to other parts of And then you're expected to tell us, so oh, there will be these manosteceptors such as you look at poo poo and you feel like vomiting. The reason you feel like vomiting is because there is a part in your brain which is called the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex will tell a part in your body which is called the vomiting center, and the vomiting center will cause nausea and vomiting. You understand that? Yeah? All right. So basically, anyways, that's what we want you to know about the stomach. The other thing that we want you to know about the stomach is that there's a disease called the Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Zollinger Ellison syndrome is a People are born with this problem. They are born with this disease. It basically causes an increase or an abnormal amount of parietal cells in the body, which end, where you end up with it, producing excessive amount of um, acid. And this excessive amount of acid, like we say, an excessive amount of acid will cause one, inflammation of the stomach, gastritis. Two, it will cause peptic ulcers, and then, if you're not lucky, it may cause gastric perforation. And then you end up with other issues. All right. So generally, that's it. Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Okay? We move on from the stomach. Too much about the stomach. Don't worry. You go read it to make sense. The pancreas. Let's talk about the, sorry, the liver. Let's talk about the liver. So, very quickly, like I said, the anatomy you learn in anatomy. But we want you to know, number one, the liver is found on the right side of the abdomen, under the diaphragm. Number two, the liver is made up of two lobes. There is a right lobe and a left lobe. And then number three, we want you to know that the liver has the ligaments. 
there are these ligaments that support the liver to be in the place where it is supposed to be. And then number four, we want you to know that the, there is a blood vessel which comes from the intestines going to the liver, which is known as the hepatic portal vein. And then there's a blood vessel which comes from the artery, from the aorta going to the liver, we call it the hepatic artery. And then there's a blood vessel which comes from the liver going to the vena cava, which is called the hepatic vein. Okay? So generally, that, for now, we just want you to remember that, that the liver has all those parts. You will learn about other parts later on. Now when you cut inside or go inside the liver, there are cells which make up the liver. We call these cells the hepatocytes. Now these hepatocytes are arranged in a special way. You've learned about types of capillaries, yes? You've learned that there are sinusoidal capillaries, there are continuous capillaries, and then there are fenestrated capillaries. And you learned that the liver has the fenestrated capillaries inside. And these fenestrated capillaries, they surround a group of hepatocytes. And this group of hepatocytes surrounded by one capillary is called a, what we call a portal triad. So that portal triad is going to have a capillary, is going to have another duct which we call the bowel canaliculi, and then it's also going to have a vein around it. So all that, they surround the liver to make it lobules. So inside the liver, there will be these two lobules, 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 and they are, each one of them is around, has a portal triad. Hopefully that makes sense. There is a portal triad, which means the vein, a bowel canaliculi, and a capillary. That's the triad. And within, around each of these triads, there is a group of cells which is known as the hepatocytes. And these hepatocytes arrange themselves into lobules. Basically, that is what we call the functional unit of the liver. And so the functional unit of the liver is basically those hepatocytes which are surrounding the autotriad. Now, what do these generally? We'll come back to this part. But for now, I want you to know what are these different functions that the liver does in the body? Number one, the liver detoxifies. Detoxification, uh, you learned about the mitochondria. They told you that the mitochondria is involved in detoxification, yes? You learned about it, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, yes? They told you that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is involved in detoxification, yes? So this automatically tells us that cells of the liver who have a lot of mitochondria, they will have a lot of endoplasmic reticulum, a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. For this very reason, for they digest or they break down the unwanted substances and also toxins like the drugs that you take in that the body doesn't need anymore. Then, the other thing that the liver does is that it goes ahead and stores <coughs> glycogen. You've learned, you're doing very okay, mine. Yes. You've learned about glycolysis, yes? Mm -hmm. You've learned about it, glycogen storage, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are also activities that for the liver, the function that the liver performs. The other function that the liver performs through the portal triad is the production of bowel which we'll talk about later on as we go. Then the other function that the liver does is storage of iron. If the human body contains too much iron, that liver will store too much iron and it will end up what we call hemocytosis. You've heard of hemocytosis? You should say yes a few seconds ago. Hemocytosis means excessive amounts of iron being stored inside the liver. That's hemocytosis. Okay. And then the other important function of the liver is excretion. 
there are substances which can only be excreted through the liver. One of them is the cholesterol. Cholesterol is an important excretory product of the liver. Okay? So uh, then the other functions you will read up about them, but uh, these are the common ones, or the important ones I want you to remember. Then, let's talk about this very important function that we talked about, to say, through the formation of the triad, we are able to produce the bile. What is bile or bile? So bile is a greenish substance, it's a fluid, and then this bile is produced by the liver and it is stored by the gallbladder. So when this bile is produced by the cells in the liver, it is transported through the bowel canalicula. A group of bowel canalicula will come together and form hepatic ducts. So there will be hepatic ducts from the left of the side of, remember I said the liver has two sides, yes? It has a left lobe and a right lobe. So the canaliculi from the left side will join together and they will form the left bowel duct. The canaliculi on the right join together and form the right bowel duct. And then the two bowel ducts will join together and form a common bowel duct. And this common bowel duct will carry this delay towards the gallbladder before, or before food is entering the intestines. And then from there, if once it's stored in there, it moves through the cystic duct into the gallbladder. Now, what we want you to remember about gallbladder is that it has three parts. The gallbladder has a head, <coughs> so it has a pandas, it has a body, and it has a neck. So the part where the cystic duct joins the gallbladder, that's the neck. Then the other, the whole middle part is the body, and then at the turning where it makes a curve, that's your fundus. So that's where it stores this gall belay. What does this gall that do to the belay? Number one, it concentrates. It allows this bow to sit, 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 and become concentrated. Number two, it allows this to be stored awaiting for um, food in the intestines. And number three, it secretes the bowel up as and when it is needed. That's what the gallbladder does for secretion, for storage, and for concentration of the <coughs> bowel. Basically. The other thing that the gallbladder does is that it has mucus cells which produce mucus. And some people will even plus or minus, they argue that there is bicarbonate there, which I doubt. <coughs> but some books, if you read them, they'll tell you there will be bicarbonate produced their side for neutralization. Okay? So generally, what does this bowel do when it is put inside the, when it's secreted inside the intestine? So what does this bowel do when it's secreted into the intestines? We know this from the tool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That it is produced emulsification of fats. You know emulsification of fats, son. Right? So emulsification of fats simply means to separate the fats from being one single big goblet. It makes into smaller goblets. What is the significance of emulsification of fats? digestion and increasing surface area. Number one, it exposes the molecules of the fat to enzymes so that they can be digested. Number two, it increases surface area so that these particles can be, they can be absorbed. So absorption needs this emulsification to take place. So this emulsification, how does it happen? Put simply, you've heard of the word antipathic, yes? So antipathic meaning there is a positive charge and a negative charge. And once the fatty acids are exposed to bile, they, it forms what is known as a micelle. You know micelles, yes? You've heard of micelles? Yes. Whereby the nonpolar region will interact with the nonpolar area, uh, where, uh, while the polar region interact with it, the surrounding water, and therefore making small, small droplets. Yes? 
And then these small, small droplets, like we said, number one, they allow for exposure to enzymes, and number two, they allow for absorption, easy absorption, okay? The bar also contains other things that are important for other functions. Uh, number one, the other function, uh, if you look at the composition of bowel, you have bowel contain bowel salts, they contain bowel pigments, they contain ions, and they also contain bicarbonates. So the bicarbonates, the main function is the neutralization. When the bicarbonate is exposed to the acid coming from the stomach, neutralization occurs. When the bowel is exposed to the food in the stomach, these bowel salts are the ones that do this function called the emulsification. These bowel salts will also, when they are exposed in the intestine, they cause the gastroenteric reflex. They encourage gastroenteric reflex. In other words, they encourage the production of hormones that will increase either bowel secretion or that will increase the pancreatic juices. And this function is called the echolorectic function. You understand? Huh? We are saying bowel salts, when they are exposed in the intestine, they encourage the production of hormones such as the cholecystokinin and secretin, which encourage the production of more bile by the liver, and they also encourage the secretion of bile from the gallbladder, and they also encourage the secretion of pancreatic juices. This function is called the chlororectic function of bile salts. The bile salts at the same time, when they are in the intestines, they encourage, remember we said the gastroenteric reflex causes increased movements. So we are saying when bowel salts are exposed in the intestine, they tell the intestine, can you please increase movement? So there will be increased movement of them. So that increased movement is what we call the laxative effect. You know laxatives are medicine that causes diarrhea. They are called laxatives. They encourage movement of the intestine towards the anus. It increases the intestinal motility. All right. So, coming back to the other functions of bowel. Bowel contains um, what we call bowel pigments. <clears throat> the common bowel pigment that we know about is bilirubin. Yes? Yes. So this bilirubin, how is it made and how is it coming about into the bowel? There is something called a enterohepatic circulation. So how does enterohepatic circulation happen? Number one, there will be cells, red blood cells, that will be old, they will reach their hundred and you've learned about blood die. Yes. And when you're learning about blood, they told you that red blood cells can live up to 120 days, yes? yes? So you have this red blood cell that has lived up to 120 days. And then it will find itself in the spleen, and the spleen will be like, I think your time is up, it dies. When the red blood cell dies, there will be exposure of hemoglobin. We already know hemoglobin contains um, him and the globin. It will be broken down, the heme and the globin. Globin is recycled. The heme contains ion and the porphyrin group. So the porphyrin group will be broken down into bilirubin. Bilirubin will be broken down into bilirubin. Bilirubin will be carried by the albumin. You learned in blood, that is blood proteins and the things they carry, yes? So bilirubin will be carried by the albumin in the blood all the way to the liver. And when the bilirubin reaches the liver, the liver is going to get to these bowel acids. One of these bowel acids is called colonic acid, and the other is called colic acid. And then the other one is called the kenodeoxycholic acid. And the other one is called tyrocholic acid. And the other one is called lithocholic acid. Anyway, something like that. 
So they are acids found in the bow, and these acids which are found in the bow, what does the liver do? It gets this acid and it binds it to the pyrrubin, and we call that a conjugated pyrrubin, pyrrubin that has been attached to a salt. So this pyrrubin that has been attached to these acids, it is now able to dissolve in water on its own and it's able to be passed out or through the period. So that's where now you have these things we call bio pigments, <coughs> being conjugated bio pigments in the bio. So the bio is excreted. So these bio pigments are excreted together with the, the bio in the intestine. And when they reach the intestine, they will reach a place which is called the large intestine. They will find bacteria in the large intestine, in the microbiology, in microbiology, in microbiology you've had that lecture called normal flora, yes? Next semester. <coughs> you guys are closing. No. 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 Mm. We are not closing. It's just closing. We are not. When are you supposed to close? We are not closing. <laughs> we are closing for a weekend. Just one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your actual coordinator? Who's your coordinator? You don't have a coordinator. It depends. Yeah, you can. All right. But why don't you ask him, say, why aren't we closing also? You don't want to close. We want. You should ask him. Oh, what you can do is, you know, this, just people that are just seated here, just this group, you walk all the way to the dean's office and say, but dean, main campus is closed. You sit there, you wait for him to sign a paper that the main campus is closed for two weeks, Second years are going on holiday. Pass it. Come back, pack your bags, go home, sleep in peace, and come back. Ah, we dangerous. Easy, yeah. <laughs> it's close, please. Just get yourself organized and make some noise, and then you go home for two weeks. All right. I I don't have human rights. Coming back. So. What I was saying was that the intestines have this thing called normal flora. And this thing called normal flora, it breaks down conjugated bilirubin. And once it, bro it has broken down this conjugated bilirubin, depending on the products, sometimes it will break down the conjugated bilirubin and form a substance that can be reabsorbed into the intestine. And when it's reabsorbed into the intestine, it goes back to the liver. And sometimes to produce this weird substance called stecobilin. And this thing called stecobilin can be excreted together with the, the feces. And it gives the feces a unique color. The other thing it can produce is the urobilinogen. This thing called urobilin, it, it can be reabsorbed, goes to the urine, to the kidneys, and it's excreted out. Okay? So in other words, we are saying, when bilirubin reaches the intestine, it has different, uh, what do you call it, different destinations, depending on the amount of digestion that has occurred using normal flora. Some of it is reabsorbed really back to the liver. Some of it is reabsorbed and then excreted by the kidneys in urine. Some of it is passed out as stool. You will read late in the books that, depending on which book you read, most of the books will tell you that majority of the bio salts, almost 90% of bio salts, are reabsorbed and they go back to the liver. And this reabsorption is what we call enterohepatic circulation. This is important because it helps with the, the continued production of bio. Now, this continued production of bile, why is it so important? Because there is a substance in the body which is called cholesterol, 
and this substance called cholesterol, you don't want it to accumulate in the body. And you also don't want it to accumulate in the liver. So what the body does is that every time there is cholesterol, the body will break down the cholesterol into these bowel acids. And then that part of the cholesterol that cannot be broken down into bowel acid is attached to the bowel acid so that it goes out as part of bowel. So in other words, they are saying the excretion of cholesterol depends on how reliable this enterohepatic circulation is working. So if we are not excreting this cholesterol, then what happens? The cholesterol will sit in the gallbladder, and in that gallbladder it will form stones, and therefore you end up with what are known as the gallstones. This is why when you go do a scan, they tell you you have gallstones, what do we tell you? Stop eating fatty foods. Go sholo. If you know sholo, why? You go sholo. Until those that cholesterol is there, is take easy, broken down. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But at the end of the day, what, what you're trying to do is, if you reduce the fatty foods, you increase the enterohepatic circulation, hopefully the cholesterol will dissolve and it, it will be carried out, hopefully. 80, 60% of the people, cholesterol source and gallstones don't come out. And therefore, that's why you see this diagram here. And when you see stones, we literally mean stones, like literally. A stone, that stone. Imagine we open your up and we see stones like that. It's a very sorry sight. And those are painful things, very painful things. But anyways, don't worry. We won't ask you in the exam mind. But we just want you to remember that if you do not excrete cholesterol, it will sit in the gallbladder and it will cause gallstones. So therefore, the Continued production of bowel is important. The other thing I want you to know is that if the bowel is not enough, if the body is not producing enough bowel, you're going to have a problem which is called steatorrhea. Have you heard of steatorrhea? Steatorrhea means <coughs> an increased amount of fat in the stool. Not many people do this. But I'm supposed to advise you as a practitioner. I'm supposed to tell you that when you go sit in the toilet, you do the number two business. When you stand up, don't flush and walk away. No. What do you do? You turn around, you bend, you look at your stool, you smell it, you study it. <laughs> and then you flush, then you walk away. <laughs> Very important. Okay, like, from today onwards, it is a medical practice that after doing poop, you should study or examine your poop. Reason number one is that when someone, a patient comes to you and says, but dog, it's a kind of toilet, ah, oh, see this. What's the problem? My poop is not okay. What do you do? Please do your business. Then after that, you examine and you smell. Then you'll be like, I, Nayanga is so charming. If for some reason, Yako is so charming. I just do number one. Because you seem to know why. So, what I'm trying to tell you is that it is important to examine no more stool. There is a simple question that you ask people. And this simple question is, when you go and poop and you flush, does the poop go or does it remain floating? You know the significance of that is, like we said, if your poop is not digesting fat, the fat will stay in the poop. And then when it reaches the water in the toilet, what happens? Fat does not dissolve, does not sink, yes? Because it does not like mixing with water. Even when you pour, cook, pour cooking oil on water, what does it have? It goes floats on top. So if you have a poo that floats on top of the water, you flash the end. You flash. 
Conclusion, too much fat, which means very little what? Bile. You understand, ka? Ato, masa kamana? Yo, already. This is someone who has issues, who may have other issues. Anyway, so now you don't need to know the issues that come with that. But have an idea. Yeah. So that when you are home, there are someone is telling you, no, me, I'm having a problem. What's the problem? I go to the toilet nowadays, poop is not flashy. You understand, right? <coughs> and then you explain to them, and people will be like, oh, it's not too much of a doctor. Right? <laughs> All right. <coughs> OK, so that's vow. The other thing I want you to know about vow is that if the vow is not being excreted from the liver, you're going to have a problem called jaundice. You've heard of jaundice, yes? So jaundice is the yellowing of the eyes and the yellowing of the skin and the yellowing in the mouth. It's called jaundice. So this jaundice or this yellowing is caused by an abnormal amount of bilirubin in the body. It basically tells us that this bilirubin is not going out. What are the things that can cause that? You are what is known as prehepatic jaundice. Prehepatic jaundice means there is a problem before the bilirubin reaches the, the liver. And this problem most of the time is that there are too many red blood cells which are dying. Uh, you've seen people with malaria, someone with severe, severe malaria, they end up having yellow eyes. Why do they have yellow eyes? Because malaria destroys red blood cells. And that destruction of red blood cells ends up exposing the hemoglobin, and the body uses that hemoglobin, produces bilirubin, and then there is an excessive amount of bilirubin. The bilirubin is too much that the liver is failing to keep up, and therefore it builds up and forms yellow eyes and yellow urine. So the next time you see someone with malaria, you should always, always remember to ask them to say, have you noticed yellow eyes? Have you noticed yellow urine? That, like I said, the significance is you want to know the extent of red blood cell damage. Right. All right. Number two cause of jaundice is what we call liver failure, which is a hepatic cause. Liver failure, like we mentioned, there are those hepatocytes which surround the, the phototriad. And those hepatocytes in those lobules, when they get damaged or they get destroyed, they fail to convert this, to conjugate this bilirubin. Therefore, you have what is called indirect hyperbilirubinemia. And this indirect hyperbilirubinemia has one very big problem. That one very big problem is that it will go to the brain, it will sit in the brain, and it will cause you to start thinking otherwise. The way we know that bilirubin has reached the brain is one simple question. You give someone a pen, you ask them, can you please draw a circle? So whenever we see someone has yellow eyes, the first thing we give them, give them a pen, draw a circle. I can assure you, if bilirubin has reached the brain, even something as simple as writing one is a problem. Very difficult. Write two, very difficult. But the person knows what they're doing. High school degree, time. But they are failing to draw circles, to draw triangles. And then you know that this is a person with the, what we call hyper, it's called hepatic encephalopathy. They have hepatic encephalopathy. So, what is the common cause of hepatic encephalopathy in adults? Very simple. We drink alcohol every day. And when you drink alcohol, it goes to the liver, it burns the liver. You drink alcohol, it goes to the liver, burns the liver. The good thing about some of us and how we drink we wait for the month end, we drink, 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 until you collapse, you forget about it. The whole month, the liver will be fixing itself. When it has fixed itself, it's again a <laughs> <laughs> collapse. Aye. 
You are safer that way. We are safe. However, there are people who they wake up alcohol. They are walking on the road alcohol. <laughs> we had a man at Ridgeway campus. I think he died now. If he doesn't drink alcohol, he will be lying down, shaking and shivering. Just give, just like a drop on the tongue. Ah, he <laughs> gets up, starts washing things, shining. I, I don't even know what happened in the to that man. He was, I think, the whole time I was at Ridgeway, from the time I started first year until I finished seventh year, that man was there every day, every hour. The moment you just walk outside the room, he's there drinking. You go inside to sleep. You wake up the following day, he's there drinking. He carries a cup bottle with him wherever he goes. It's sad that he, how he died. Very sad. He went, got himself drunk, and then went to sleep under the stairs. And no one noticed that he had died. For three days, he was just lying in the same position. I don't know, someone went to give him food. They decided maybe Rambiranja. He went to give him food, came back, found the food was still there. Tried to shake him and realize if you're lying. It's a sorry way to die. However, he, his death was a bit better. Dying because of liver failure from alcohol, I can assure you. That's why it's a very sorry side. Because you don't die today. It's like HIV. It's as bad as HIV. You are a normal healthy person. Tomorrow, Pamara Pavimba, 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 Mamboyonda, Mamboyonda. The other day you just can't walk. The other day you are confused. Then the other day you are gone. Some people, on average, it takes about four, three to four years for all of that to happen. And the number one problem, there is no cure. There is nothing we're going to do for you once the liver is damaged. So my advice to you is, as we are drinking, they don't say, they don't say stop drinking. Uh -huh. You know smoking, they always say stop smoking. Aye. But drinking, they say what? Eh? Drink responsibly. Aye. So my advice to you is, eh? drink responsibly. Because alcohol destroys the liver terribly. The problem we have with Africans is that if my neighbor drinks and I drink, then everyone will be enticing each other. Even if I get sick, I'll always be telling myself, but my neighbor, but my neighbor, what's the shadow? It's important to remember that um, that's what they say, isn't it? The way you take alcohol and the way your neighbor takes alcohol is different. How I will react to alcohol and how my neighbor will react to alcohol is different. Have you ever haven't you seen those people? Walk church, I'm a every day, banzabo, Mubilimba, every day. We had a roommate like that. This roommate brings a boy every week, every week, eh, eh, the whole night. Eh. The following night, eh, eh, the whole night. So my roommate was like, you know what? Let me try. Try what? Let me, let me try. Brings like a guy, eh, eh, then that night, two weeks later, no peace. One month later, no peace. <laughs> Three months later, Pamara Pavim. Bafu and you know, they are strategies. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me about strategies? So, my point is, there are some people, you just go once and you are gone. And then you have people that will do the same thing over and over again and never get caught. <laughs> so, it's to remember that, Chiramuntu na Chiwacha, right? So if you if you're not if you feel like no one cup of tea, one cup is enough for oh you don't drink. If you don't drink, don't drink. It's okay, it's fine. It looks fun from outside. But my friend, when you're there, it's not things. Alright. Moving on. 
Eu, eu tot te spun nu. Eu sei doar nu, eu prefer doar nu. Ah, can take advantage. In the last 10 minutes, we're going to talk about this, the pancreas, then we can go. So, very quickly, <coughs> under the stomach, you have this organ <coughs> called the pancreas. The pancreas has four parts. It has a head, it has a neck, it has a body, and it has a tail. In the middle of the pancreas, There is a tube which passes through and goes all the way to the second part of the duodena. This is known as the pancreatic duct. Depending on um, what is known as variation, there are some people who have two pancreatic ducts. One pancreatic duct is known as the main pancreatic duct. The other pancreatic That is known as an accessory pancreatic duct. Like I mentioned, not everyone has an accessory pancreatic duct, but everyone has a main pancreatic duct. So this main pancreatic duct, it carries pancreatic juices. The pancreas has two types of cells, or gen two types of, you know, let's say we have The cells that make up the pancreas are grouped into two different systems. You have the exocrine system and then you have the endocrine system. <coughs> so for the endocrine system, you have cells that produce hormones which are known as the islets of Langerhans. And then you have cells that produce the gastric juices which are basically your glands, your uh, digestive glands. So we'll focus more on the, the cells that produce the digestive juices. The cells that produce hormones, which are basically the cells of the islands of Langer hands, you will learn about them later on. So, however, it's in, yeah, you will learn about them as we go. So, what are the substances that are produced by these cells of the um, digestive system? These cells, they produce, number one, trypsinogen. They produce also carboxidases, lipids. Generally, 90% of the enzymes that are involved in digestion of food come from the pancreas. So, this pancreas also produces the salivary fluid, and this salivary <coughs> fluid usually contains the carbonic and hydrates which goes ahead and produces for us bicarbonate which is important for neutralization of acid coming from the stomach. So, what we want you to remember mostly is that the most important of these enzymes is the trypsinogen. We want you to remember that these enzymes are produced in an inactive state And when they are produced in an inactive state, they have to be activated for them to start working. And trypsin is the enzyme that activates other enzymes. All other enzymes can be activated once the trypsinogen has been activated. So how is trypsinogen activated? Number one, there is what is called autolytic activation. On its own, just spontaneously, it will just decide to say, I think, let me start working. That's called autolytic activation. So the body has a mechanism or a system of preventing autolytic, and this is called a trypsin inhibitor. The body produces another protein, which is called a trypsin inhibitor, which prevents the trypsin from starting to work on its own. If 
for one reason or another, for example, drinking alcohol, trypsin will start will get activated spontaneously. When you drink some, especially people who drink wine. I don't know if you've come across these kinds of people before. There are people, when they drink wine, they get this sharp stomach pain. Very sharp. You guys don't drink wine, right? We do. Sometimes. We do. Anyway, it's important for you to remember that there are some people who, when they drink tripes, when they drink alcohol, wine, like smart, wine, wine, wine beverages, that wine can cause the autolytic activation of trypsinogen into trypsin, and that trypsin will cause other enzymes to be activated, and those enzymes, they will start digesting the pancreas. And this condition is called acute pancreatitis. And this condition called acute pancreatitis causes a sharp pain in the stomach. And this condition called acute pancreatitis has no medication. How do you treat it? You just tell the person, my friend, don't drink water, don't drink alcohol, don't eat any food. God willing, in his mercies, you have, uh, which guy was that? Is it Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs? It's Steve Jobs, huh? The guy who died from pancreatitis. Yes. So Steve Jobs. He used to wake long hours of the night with the egg bottle of wine. Pangono, 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 pangono. But last, pancreas decided, my friend, let us show you the real life. And anyway, long story short, we are saying there's this thing called acute pancreatitis. It is called, comes about when the trypsin automatically activates itself before it leaves the pancreas. There are other causes which you come and learn later. Like for example, there's this thing called mumps virus, event of mumps virus. Right? Not put your mango. I don't think that causes mumps virus. That's just something else. Right? I think that's tonsillitis. It's not mumps. Mumps virus causes the uh, acute pancreatitis if you don't treat it properly. Right? And so many others. Alright. Number two. We, are, we, we want you to know that uh, the normal activation of trypsinogen is that uh, it has to be released from the pancreas, goes into the intestine, and it will find this thing called uh, enteropeptidase. So you have these enzymes which are found on the brush border of the intestine. And these enzymes are the ones that are supposed to activate the trypsin. And once it's activated in the right place, it causes activation of all the other enzymes, and then you have the digestion of the, all the other food. In Ganon, there's a whole big table to tell you that if you activate this enzyme, this will be the product. You don't need to go through that. You go look up the table, it's fine. Huh? It's fine. Huh? I don't need to tell you. Repairs will produce some. Capoxidase will produce some. Phospholipase will produce shine. You go read that. Yes. All right. Okay, so what are the things that can control the secretion of pancreatic juices? Number one, there's a cephalic phase, which, like we mentioned last time, when you start thinking about food, there's activation of the vagus nerve. How is the vagus nerve activated? The salivary glands. You know that when you look at food, it's nice, you start this salivating. That salivation is caused by your eyes will see and they activate the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve will activate the saliva. Vagus nerve will activate the stomach. Vagus nerve will activate the pancreas. So in other words, there is this thing called the, the parasympathetic heat stimulation just by looking at nice food. Number two, they would have mentioned earlier there are hormones produced when food reaches the intestines, yes? And we say some of these hormones are secreting. Secreting will increase the production of pancreatic juices. Another enzyme we talked about was this CCK, cholecystokinin. 
It's also an enzyme produced in the intestines when food reaches the intestines. You understand, huh? All right. And then you have hormones that can reduce the production of that pancreatic juices. Mostly they come from the mostly they just come from within the intestines and also from the pancreas itself. <coughs> Alright. I think we can call it a day. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.